Welcome. Um, innovation and technology are remarkable force multipliers for good guys and for bad guys. So today, we are going to discuss how innovation and technology are impacting law enforcement and intelligence uh, with members of the Five Eyes Law Enforcement Group who've been meeting here in Washington for the last several days. FELIG, as it's called, is an information sharing forum to help these agencies collaborate. I'm Jean Meserve, the host of the NatSec Tech Podcast. Thrilled to be here with this very large panel, which I will now introduce starting to my left. Um, we have with us Michael Duhem, Commissioner of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Next to him, Andrew Koster, Commissioner of the New Zealand Police. Patrick Lechtner, Lech Leitner, I can say that, uh, is Acting Director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Timothy Langan is Executive Assistant Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Sitting next to him is Heather Cook, CEO of the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. Next to her is Lisa Gale, Deputy Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police. And on the far end, uh, we have Graham Bigger, who is Director General of UK's National Crime Agency. And also with us today is Justin Wang, Vice President of the MITRE Corporation. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, PJ, uh, if you don't mind first names, that would be great. Um, you were the host. And I know you talked about a lot that you can't talk about publicly, but can you summarize for us some of the key points of discussion and perhaps agreement amongst you all during your few days of meetings? Yeah, sure, Gene. Thank you. So, uh, for the last several days, we've been meeting, um, you know, between the five countries and you know, like-minded agencies that uh, respect our democratic principles in the policing spectrum. And uh, you know, we do this routinely. We meet one, once a year. We also have subunits that meet routinely on the various topics. Uh, we are tackling the, char the, the, the challenges of today as it relates to global policing and national security and public safety. Some of the main themes we discuss is the evolving cyber threat that just continues and is very pervasive, uh, the ongoing uh, actions of transnational criminal organizations and criminal actors across the globe that affect all of our populaces and communities, and just how, as policing agencies, we can better coordinate, collaborate, to uh, serve our, our populaces. So, uh, you know, some of the main things, as I said, was kind of, you know, some innovating ways to keep up and make sure we're on track. Uh, the cyber element, you know, some examples of units we have is, you know, we look at the pervasive money laundering issues that are around the globe. Um, of course, I said technology, innovation, and just various other, you know, public safety, national security threats that affect all of our member countries. Commissioner Costner. Um, fighting transnational crime has always been a big and difficult job, but how has technology created new threats or intensified existing threats? We know transnational organised crime runs a really adaptive and aggressive business model. They will use whatever means available to them to stay ahead of enforcement. Uh, technology has really accelerated that uh, and law enforcement needs to adapt uh, significantly to stay up with it. Uh, coming together as we do, being able to share um, methods, being able to reflect on common challenges um, is a really important part of tackling that. Justin, did you want to weigh in? Uh, Austin. Uh, Austin, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, and I think from Different uh, city. As, uh, in the, yes, in the uh, confluence between the intelligence community and law enforcement, certainly agree, and traditionally has been uh, from a technology front, this uh, adversary versus uh, law enforcement or intelligence aspect on uh, you know, as you have capability, you also have countermeasures. But I think more so from a technology front, we're at an inflection point where uh, we need to advise policymakers on these truly uh, cutting edge emerging technologies like quantum biosecurity to have a broader impact beyond the capability realm of uh, good guys versus bad guys in their use of technology. I, I, I think I would add, I'll go back to what Andrew said. I, I can't. I, you really have to emphasize the, po the, the point that technology is, is going so fast that it's, uh, it's actually outpacing our ability to adjust legislation. And when you look at from a law enforcement perspective, we play within certain parameters, but when you're dealing with the people that we deal with on a daily basis, there are no parameters. So it's extremely difficult for, the or for, for a policing uh, organization to keep ahead of that technology, to keep, uh, keep, uh, keep ahead to, to address the threats. Yeah. Heather or Lisa, did you want to weigh in? 
Yeah. Mike was just make going, about, just made the point uh, I was about to make. So um, yeah, no, I'm happy to move on to okay. another question. Like. Um, we did solicit some questions from the press, which were given to us ahead of time. This one comes from Nicole Skanga of CBS News. Um, even before October 7, Five I members faced a complex array of terrorist threats. How has the Israel-Gaza war and rising tensions throughout the Middle East contributed to the threat landscapes on your respective home fronts? Is this an unprecedented moment? And uh, Tim Langan, this one has your name on it, so I'll let you take it first. Thanks, Jean. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so even before the war started, there was an alarming uptick in, in counterterrorism threats, both stemming from domestic issues and external uh, that we've been seeing in the Bureau and across our, our partnerships here in Five Eyes. But we've definitely seen uh, a strong uptick uh, in uh, uh, cases, uh, threats uh, directed uh, at uh, Jewish uh, individuals, uh, along with uh, threats uh, against uh, Arab Americans as well. Um, so, you know, what we're concerned is across the spectrum an alarming rise in the amount and volume of threats. Um, so, uh, you know, we're I think that this is one of the issues that we talked about collectively trying to mitigate these threats. Uh, how we're seeing it across the board and ways we can work together to try to mitigate some of those. Is technology playing a larger part in this th threat landscape that you're facing at this moment than it has historically? I think, I think the use of technology for individu individuals to communicate, um, both uh, ideology uh, to organize, definitely is. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of woven through almost uh, all uh, programs and uh, and areas that we may be concer uh, concerned with. If Lisa? I could just add to that, uh, what we're seeing in today's environment, as you heard Mike um, speak earlier, is that technology is advancing ahead at such a rapid rate that it's very difficult for us to keep up with it. Uh, what comes as a result of that is we see today the bridge between what is the online environment and what is the real real life environment are closing and in fact I'd probably say there is no difference between the two now and the reason I raise that is because when we start to talk about some of uh, these crimes and threats um, that we are all experiencing across uh, the five eyes you look at the influence that the online environment has particularly with young people um, and the opportunity um, to exploit vulnerabilities um, in some instances to radicalise uh, young people. We know similarly within um, the child protection environment it also presents in um, issues such as sextortion, another um, really um, concerning emerging um, threat. So I think that's, that's what we're starting to see in terms of the role that technology is playing. Uh, everyone has a device now. We know people are online 24-7. Graham, what's the situation in Britain? So uh, just on the terrorism point, I was going to, going to add that we see, I think, these, these days a much quicker polarisation of the news cycle, of, of, of how people are receiving their information. And sometimes that is uh, real information, but only one side of a story, and sometimes it is pure kind of misinformation and disinformation. But because people are in their polarised groups, that, that gets accelerated and it creates a radicalisation. So it is a horrific events that are happening in Israel and Gaza at the moment, but it is creating more radicalization, I think, in our countries and our streets than a similar event would have done 10 or 15 years ago because of the way people receive information. Andrew, did you want to comment? Yeah, I strongly agree with that, and I think it's also the challenge for frontline policing that the immediacy of social media creates. So an event happens, it gets reported online, sometimes accurately, sometimes not, and you can have an immediate and significant response that requires police to mobilise without having been able to plan for it, and, and so that has its own layers of complexity as well. Encryption is a subject that every one of you or your points of contact raised in our preliminary conversation. This is the bright red light, as far as I could see, in terms of your challenges um, created by technology. Um, I'd love to hear about the impact it's having on investigations in your respective countries. Um, Heather, why don't I start with you? Thank you, Jean. Absolutely uh, a, a, tar a topic of uh, great discussion uh, and has been for many years now. Um, it, the evolution of, uh, of encryption uh, has been a, uh, obviously both a 
positive um, element of, of our online lives. It creates privacy and the ability to conduct business uh, in a secure fashion. It protects identities and, and uh, private data. Um, but clearly, uh, it can have that opposite effect for uh, law enforcement in that uh, it provides havens and places for uh, adversaries, criminality, um, extremism to hide. Um, we are constantly uh, in that, uh, I guess, that battle between uh, uh, not interfering with the rights to privacy, but finding that balance of where where is lawful interception or lawful access uh, appropriate. And technology is, is, is creating a lot of difficulty uh, in that space, and I think we've had to be much more um, clever and creative uh, about how we go about uh, the work of, of law enforcement uh, and our intelligence work as well. And uh, I think laws have been helpful. There's been uh, legislative solutions to some of these issues which uh, allow uh, you know, continued uh, ability to lawfully intercept communications, for instance. But we are moving very quickly in a direction where uh, those avenues are not going to be open. And when we start talking about end-to-end -end encryption, we're absolutely uh, in, in that territory where it will be impossible, uh, virtually impossible, um, for, for law enforcement to be able to uh, conduct its business in the way that it has before. And I think it creates a real challenge and, and obviously a, a responsibility on the part of the tech companies that are involved in uh, creating this uh, environment to be thinking very deeply about um, their responsibility in, in, in helping society reach that balance. But they're making money um, Indeed. with these technologies. Are they receptive to your arguments? It doesn't appear so at the moment. Listen, they have been uh, receptive to a point, and, and uh, I wouldn't want to uh, put um, all of them in the same bucket, and I'm not going to get into detail here, but um, I think we are moving in a direction where um, they are putting themselves potentially in a place where they're not going to be able to have the, con the conversation or uh, be able to work, uh, work with us to be able to us, uh, enable us to continue our, our work in that area. And I think it's it's going to be a very difficult uh, a difficult space. What they're creating, and I think it's important for society to be aware of this as well, and our, our populations, is that it has the effect of you know if it, if we were take our cities for instance, creating a, a cordoned off area of, of of physical space where all manner manner of crime or atrocity would be able to be permitted, uh, and and these would be lines that law enforcement or authorities could not cross. Um, so able to operate with impunity and without uh, any means of uh, interrupting that. I, I think that is, it's, it wouldn't be tolerated uh, in the real world. Um, it shouldn't be t um, tolerated in the virtual world either. Grant? I mean, Heather has now said pretty much everything I was going to and incredibly <laughs> eloquently. I mean, that was fantastic. I mean, I, just to reinforce, we absolutely support encryption. I mean, even from a pure beating crime point of view, it is essential to us in protecting our um, cyber security and reducing fraud. So encryption is a good thing, but we need it to be implemented in a way that can help people, keep people safe. And that means that tech companies need to be able to help keep their users safe, and they need to be able to, um, so we, if we serve a warrant on them, you know, like a court supported warrant, then they need to be able to act on it and provide the information that we need to pursue investigations. And it can be presented, and certainly the tech companies sometimes do, as a binary choice. You can either have encryption or privacy, or you can have um, security and safety. And we just do not believe that that is the case. It is always on a spectrum, it always has been before, it always will be in the future. And we need to be able to work together to find, to find a solution that serves both ends. Yeah, I'm just going to tie into the question of uh, encryption, and I'll give you a couple stats here that are somewhat alarming. Uh, in 22-23, the RCMP's National Child Exploitation Crime Center uh, received 102,000, 103,000 uh, requests from other law enforcement agencies internationally, uh, and it's a 26% increase from the previous years. So if you tie in encryption into that, our capability to investigate these very important matters and other matters will come to stand still because of the encryption. So. Lisa. Can I just uh, further add to that to reinforce? Um, for us in Australia, uh, in the last um, calendar year, 96% of lawfully intercepted material was unintelligible because of end-to-end -end encryption. 
So 96%. I just put that data out there. The other one um, that I would also add is in relation to our Australian Centre to counter child exploitation. So similar to the Canadian experience, uh, we have had uh, in excess of 40,000 cyber tip line reports from NECMEC um, in this last year, and we're already tracking to exceed that for the next uh, financial year. And what I would say is, uh, since META has gone to end-to-end -end encryption, uh, we anticipate that up to 80% of those cyber tip line reports we will not be able to action and in real terms what that means is there will be victims not just in the online environment but real victims that we will not be able to identify and remove from harm it also means there will be offenders out there who will be able to continue to perpetrate these crimes that we will not be able to identify yeah if i may uh, i'm just going to reinforce a lot with my my colleagues uh technology is agnostic technology is not you know, doesn't choose sides. However, we need to be responsible with that technology. And we not it's not just the government, it's not just the police. It's also the tech se sector, it's industry, it's the populace. We need to use this responsibly. And if, if encryption exists to such a degree that we cannot access that information, then as public servants, to, our charge is to protect and serve. If we can't access it, we cannot protect and we cannot serve. It, it's a responsible use issue. It, encryption is is good. It's a it's a it's a needed thing, as is my colleague Cram said. However, it's responsible use, but that goes both ways. Tim, um, the FBI launched its own uh, encryption company, right, to try and catch some people. Encryption device company, and I gather you did this. You're not familiar. Um, I think you did it with the Australians. Yes. Um, yes. And you ended up rounding operation. up a whole yeah. lot of yes. people. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, you've done it once. It strikes me that you can't do it a second time because now they've all gotten wise to the possibility. But well, please. I think, well, I think, again, we've got to try to look for novel ways to uh, increase our ability to disrupt their actions, right? So um, it's an extension of the operations that we've done before, just in a, a new spin of, of using undercover operations, using platforms to where um, we can elicit uh, criminals to come to us if we if they think that we are providing them with something that will expand their criminal enterprise, if we're a partner with them, or if we're potentially a victim. So it's an expansion of what we would do in our given authorities to try to uh, bring uh, intelligence and focus on those criminal organizations. This was a global effort, an incredible partnership uh, that disrupted uh, potentially thousands of criminal actors. So. Uh, I think you've said it very well, too. But you can't do it again, in that particular way, well, at least. Yeah, I, I think, again, you, you always look for new and better ways. Uh, criminals get smarter. Uh, there's only going to be so many ways you can use the same trap to catch and the mouse. What, what I would say, sorry, Graham, I would just add to that, that we know that criminals are adapting and learning from some of these operations. And so as we go forth and we um, disrupt and prosecute, we know that they're then adapting their um, methodology so that they can avoid further detection from law enforcement. Austin, I'd love to come to you, both on encryption and quantum and yes. what that's going to mean down the road. Yeah, uh, we've heard a bit about tech companies. And so I think we have a particular advantage uh, in the contract we have in the US under the FFRDC or the Fairly Funded Research and Development Model to where uh, um, entities such as MITRE operates those on behalf of the government. And through that is a means for uh, government elements to engage in further depth of expertise when it comes to research. And so with that, on the topics of AI and quantum and encryption, as an example, uh, we undertake efforts on behalf of government uh, on things like the quantum moonshot efforts within MITRE to look at both the benefits of a quantum capability as well as the uh, the downsides of post-quantum encryption and what that means to existing systems. And so those are just some examples to where uh, MITRE as an organization, whereas we're a tech company, we're a not-for-profit, and we're really looking out for capabilities we can bring to government to really help enhance the things that you and your team do every day. How are you all preparing for the advent of quantum? From a New Zealand perspective, uh, you know, we're, we're a pretty small uh, jurisdiction. We take great um, support and encouragement from being part of, of this group here. And law enforcement uh, can do a lot to adapt as well. 
but the way that technology enables um, the breadth of offending, the dispersed nature of it, um, the sheer volume means that law enforcement can't resolve these issues by itself and we need technology providers, we need platform providers to take responsibility for the safety of the people in their environments and we need systems to be designed safe because you'll never catch all of the offenders with the volume that they're going to be able to work at using some of these technologies. So I think a really strong message you're hearing from this table is uh, providers need to take responsibility if people are going to be safe in a virtual world. And John, if I may, there's no one law enforcement organization in the world that's standing on its own. We're all facing the same problem. Here's a good, a good uh, committee here, if you like, uh, where we exchange best practices, where we have working groups to find out uh, solutions, potential solutions that would benefit not just the people at the table, but would benefit law enforcement writ large? Uh, we have a cyber security question, which is aimed right at you, Graham. Uh, this is from Will Vernon, Will Vernon, who says, if you talk, uh, could you talk about the cyber threat to the UK, specifically from China? All right, yeah. So, I mean, we have cyber threats from a whole range of countries, from both countries and from, uh, from criminals. Frankly, the, the, the threat from China as a state has more been an espionage um, threat, and we have seen that directed uh, absolutely at our government, um, but also at our industry in a kind of industrial espionage uh, way. And um, we have been investigating that, and we've been calling it out, and uh, we did that collectively as, uh, as a group of countries uh, with sanctions uh, really quite recently. Um, and that's one part of the cyber threat we, we face. We also face a, a really significant cyber crime threat, uh, including from uh, ransomware, uh, which is largely emanated from the Russian-speaking uh, world. And there's been a number of major players um, there that have been very significant. And that causes billions of pounds or dollars worth of damage to the economy uh, throughout our countries. And we had a really good success uh, two months ago, kind of working together. Uh, and the latest in a series of successes that we've had between us and working with other partners uh, around the world, in, in Europe, in Singapore, and Japan. Uh, but the one two months ago was against Lockbit. Um, so at the time, and for the last few years, the biggest single ransomware group, 25% uh, of the market. Uh, and working together with a range of organizations, but particularly the FBI in this case, uh, we infiltrated that ransomware group. Um, and we took it down. Uh, to make it largely not operative anymore. But the one point I'd add, and it links to some of the other um, operations that we've been doing, is our aim has not just been to infiltrate different groups and take them down, because others will just pop up instead. What we've also been trying to do is to undermine the trust that criminals can have when they are operating online, undermine the anonymity that they hide behind, and undermine the credibility that they can have when they, when they operate. So the whole operation was designed not just to infiltrate and take down, but to undermine that credibility, and it's been really successful. Yes, uh, uh, it was a terrific operation. Congratulations to all involved. Um, I think uh, another part of this equation around cybersecurity, because I mean, there, there's not anybody sitting at this table or anywhere around the world that uh, whose country isn't isn't dealing with this issue in the same way. Um, but a big part of this is uh, about hardening the environment by. Um, it, uh, helping others help themselves. So much about this and so much about what is being attacked is is uh, some of it's in government hands but a lot, of, most of it is privately owned or it's mums and dads and, uh, and uh, members of our community. So, uh, you know, raising awareness, um, putting out there the tools and information um, that uh, other sectors need to be uh, hardening their own uh, their own systems and creating uh, protections is is incredibly important. As well. Let me just challenge you for a moment. Mm -hmm. That message has been out there for years mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. need to harden, mm -hmm. and yet we still have this explosion of cybersecurity problems. Thoughts? I would come back again to those providing the services need to design their products to be secure, and of course we know that users and administrators need to do things to ensure that that stays current. Um, but in the end, you won't solve this problem unless we can design safety into the environment. And in, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, in Australia, we passed uh, a number of laws as well that compels, for instance, owners of critical in infrastructure uh, to, be, uh, to be taking care of this and, and, and managing this, this risk themselves. And there's quite significant ram ramifications for failure to do so. 
yeah. but we're, we're seeing we're across still, uh, uh, across the say. intel community as well as DOD and, and civil is that uh, by nature our civilizations are are built on authorities and division right for civil liberties and free capital and I believe the adversaries which operate a different model are actually exploiting those seams mm -hmm. right to to uh, get more and perhaps be more aggressive in that approach and catching us off guard in our traditional ways. I think we need to be working closer to address that. And, and Gene, as you said, though, the message has been out a long time, but there's still so many people that uh, do not uh, per, uh, follow software updating patches, uh, do not uh, practice uh, multi-factor authentication, do not have appropriate passwords. So that, that continues to be an issue. And if, if, if I may, um, a criminality has been around a long time, and, and, and cybercrime is crime at this point. Uh, so that's why this, this group exists, because we're always trying to keep up and, and if possible, stay ahead. Uh, people are still getting their houses broken into, and that, that's not changed, and I don't think that's ever going to go necessarily away. Uh, so it, it's important for us as law enforcement to collaborate as much as possible, share best practices, and ensure we're doing everything we can to mitigate those threats. There was a lot written and said about the potential impacts of generative AI on cybersecurity. And I'm curious as to whether any of you are seeing, at this point, a major impact. Anybody want to take that one? I wonder whether it's it's less at this point on cyber security per se and more on criminal offending. So for example, uh, the generation of child sexual abuse imagery that makes it very hard for law enforcement to tell whether the imagery is artificially generated or real, and that makes it hard to protect or harder to protect real victims. Um, we also see the impact of, uh, you know, f fake images on people's perception of reality, and then the acts that that can cause them to want to go and do in the real world in response to those images. Um, so it. it doubles the impact of mis and disinformation, um, you know, and can tie back into world events uh, where people are maliciously generating perceptions about what's happening that don't reflect the truth. Lisa. Can I um, add to that? Um, in Australia, uh, we have recently had a successful mm. prosecution uh, mm. of a gentleman who used AI for um, child abuse uh, to create child abuse material. And so the message that I would convey out here is anyone that is using AI for those purposes, it is an offence, it is a crime, and we will come and get you. So uh, certainly for us, we're just starting um, down the track in terms of the prosecutorial process with those. But what, what I would also say is, uh, certainly for our experience, is we also think that we need to, in an ethical and accountable way, work with um, non-traditional partners, such as academia, um, in order to leverage off what AI can actually do. Um, and if I could just talk about uh, a project that um, the Australian Federal Police are doing in Australia with uh, one of our universities in Victoria, Monash University. Um, it's a project called ALEX, and it stands for um, AI for Law Enforcement and Community Safety, and it's a laboratory. And what it is, is uh, it does a number of projects, but one in particular is uh, called My Pictures Matter. And the intent of that particular project um, is for members of the community, with their consent, um, to provide images of themselves uh, as children, um, clothed in normal settings, uh, to uh, the university. And those images will be used by AI to build a database so that we will be able to use AI to di distinguish between what is child abuse material and what is not. Uh, and the reason that is so important for a number of things, one is for our officers, uh, the psychosocial um, impact that that has on officers having to view thousands of hours of horrific, of, on often a case's horrific child abuse material will be reduced but also uh, it will um, enhance our ability to actually identify uh, victims. So uh, uh, early days, and I guess if I could use this as a plug, if that's okay, we're looking for, it's not just Australian-based people that are willing to um, consensually provide your um, images, but anywhere, so anyone watching, uh, we really, we have a goal, we need 10,000 to help 
um, the AI machine learning. Um, we're not quite there yet, so um, if anyone is interested, please, I encourage you to volunteer your images. How many do you have now? We've just got under, just under 4,000. Getting there. Graham. So I'll just add to that. So we, we are absolutely seeing uh, the use of AI in child sexual abuse uh, cases. And there's been quite a lot of chatter on dark websites and even some open websites by paedophiles about how they could, uh, how they could use it to best effect. Uh, and it is absolutely offence uh, in the UK jurisdiction, as the same as it is in Australia, uh, to create AI images uh, of, of children. Uh, we are also seeing it in fraud. So mm -hmm. that's been, we haven't really covered that um, so far, but the, the growth in fraud and largely online enabled fraud has been one of the big uh, things that we have seen from the development of the internet and technology over the last decade or so. And we can see some real uh, dangers from the use of AI within fraud, whether it's to write more compelling scripts for, um, for phishing emails, um, or to try and mimic uh, kind of voice or uh, you know, identification in calls. And that's something that we need to be really aware of and organisations like the tech sector and the financial sector need to be really conscious of as well as they design their systems. But I would just end, uh, as, as Lisa said, there are also huge advantages. I mean, we do not see technology as a threat. As, as PJ said, it is agnostic and there are huge things that we can do with technology to help make people safer and to help investigate crime. So we need to make sure we are grabbing the benefits as well as preparing for the risks. Heather, you're using AI in what sounded to me like a novel way to track drug usage. Uh, I think you're thinking, yeah, it wasn't a, it's not AI, I think you're talking about our wastewater yeah. Uh, monitoring. Yeah, I thought it was AI that was filtering yeah, the samples. No, it's, it's not, it's more pure science uh, than, than, than that, kind of old school science, but um, it gets to uh, a point that Lisa was making about the uh, importance of, uh, of of partnering more broadly uh, in the uh, in this in this challenge, including with academia. So it's a program where uh, we and it started in the uh, Criminal Intelligence Commission. I think others are doing it now, but we started about seven years ago, partnering with two universities in in Australia to uh, to sample um, wastewater uh, around the country, uh, and you know to be able to um, separate and identify. Um, uh, drug traces or traces of drug in uh, drugs in wastewater and it allows us to regularly over the course of, of a year and now seven years collect data on on drug usage so it's 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 an accurate reflection of drug consumption uh, in the country not necessarily about how many how much drugs are coming in or uh, making their way in but but actual drug drug consumption and it's very valuable data that's used by law enforcement because it, it pinpoints uh, particular types of drugs and where they're uh, uh, prevalent across the country, in what quantities, uh, certainly allows uh, health programs and education programs uh, uh, um, and social you know, support programs to be targeting their efforts more effectively in the Department of Health, for instance. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's partnering. It, it was an intelligence endeavor, but it, partnering with it, academia. Um, that is not only having a law enforcement benefit, but a broader, uh, broader policy be benefit as well. Austin, I wanted to, to ask you about standards of law enforcement and whether those are challenged in some of these technology environments. Yeah, I think with, with AI, <coughs> it, it brings a new uh, uh, optic through which we view data, for example, right? And, and so uh, as a, you know, a career intelligence officer, often we equate data with the sensitivity of where it's collected and so often it's classified based on that sensitivity. I think in order to get the most out of AI from a use standpoint, we need to look at what can we get from a, the value of the data versus the sourcing of the data and perhaps come up with ways to better curate the data uh, to differentiate that so we get more use out of it while still protecting the sourcing. And so I think that's something that we need to look at from a, a data standpoint as it relates to AI in order to better prepare ourselves for getting the most use out of AI. Uh, examples such as uh, can an AI or large language model be compelled to testify, for example, uh, on the you know, traditional sense, we have expert witnesses testify. Can a AI system, right, or do we need to change our systems in order to allow for that in, in the due process of law? Another one that we face in the intelligence community is the uh, aging off of collection. How does the AI model once learn something uh, and then aged off, how can it unlearn it? And so things like that, I think, provide examples of what we need to look into and explore from a further use of AI, given our current approach to uh, data and, and our holdings. 
I can see challenges down the road in the, with the use of AI, which welcome the tool because it speeds up. And Lisa, you, you hit a few points, uh, especially with child sexual exploitation with our members, the police officer who are actually going case by case. Sometimes that will speed it up, less exposed. But I can see a time where, where you're going to go to court and you're going to have to explain to a judge the whole principle of how you got there on the AI side of things, which could be another, another challenge. Um, Heather, you brought up drugs, so I want to insert here a question from Nicole Sanga of CBS, who asks, for U.S. and Canadian leaders, what are the greatest roadblocks in curbing the flow of fentanyl into your countries and across the U.S.-Canadian border? Are you seeing an uptick in trafficking along that border? And how cooperative or not has China been in curbing the flow of precursor chemicals into your respective countries? Tim, you want to take that first? Sure. Well, so starting off with the roadblocks, I mean, if we start with the the supply chain of, of what is creating the fentanyl issue, the precursors being manufactured in China, um, we've addressed them. We've not seen any significant um, actions by Chinese law enforcement to either deter or to try to lessen those productions and, and stem and flow uh, predominantly for us into, into Mexico. Um, so that's that's one roadblock. Secondly. The, the cartel's manufacturer and production that is happening in Mexico. We work very well with the Mexican authorities, but the extent of the problem is vast. Um, so that's, that's another roadblock, obviously, there. And then trying to identify those network chains that go, that go into the United States. Um, you know, I'll let my Canadian colleagues uh, answer a little bit more about what they're seeing from their side of the border, but I would not say that we've seen an uptick from the, from the northern border. The, the most of uh, the fentanyl that we're seeing is coming across the, the southern border. But there is, um, as traditional, there is, there is illicit activity that goes back and forth. It's not a border issue that can be ignored. There is a northern border, and there are issues that happen between them. And yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, put things in perspective, we had 9,000 kilometers of border between Canada and, uh, and the United States. So little under 6,000 miles for uh, yeah. <laughs> US colleagues. Thank you. So that, that in itself is a challenge. Um, I don't see much going north-south. Uh, the cost of production in Canada is, is quite elevated, so it's probably cheaper when it comes up direct from Mexico to the United States. But uh, it is a concern. I had a chance to uh, tour the country last year and visit some of our offices and meet with mayors of different uh, communities and indigenous communities. And it is a concern throughout the country, like many countries, how rampant this is spreading. The cost of the drug is really cheap. But I do want to reassure folks that uh, we have excellent collaboration with uh, several international partners. Uh, between the Canada and U.S., we have several uh, fentanyl committees that are going on, uh, trying to detect roots, uh, sharing best practice. Just uh, last uh, March in Toronto, we had uh, key partners from different agencies going over some of the key success. Uh, DEA is doing a good job with sampling and profiling, figuring out those routes. So there's a lot of work being done, but it's, it's, I'll admit it's, it's a challenge because of uh, it could be small quantities, it could be big quantities. For Canada, uh, some of the, uh, the precursors that are coming in are legal. It's only once they're transformed that they become illegal. Uh, to your question earlier to Tim with regards to China, I know in the past that China have regulated certain precursors. But what the chemists are doing are just changing that, uh, that percentage uh, of, of, uh, of uh, liquids in it, and then it, it falls outside and then it becomes something legal. So it is a challenge. Uh, law enforcement, I always say law enforcement is what but one solution. I think we have to really double down on the outreach, the awareness. Uh, there's a societal uh, approach to all of this as well. So, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, Gene, uh, yeah, so Homeland Security Investigations, HSI, is, is focused on this heavily. Uh, this is a pervasive uh, issue, this fentanyl issue, and, uh, you know, we see most, the, the bulk of it is precursors coming in to Mexico, being produced and coming across. Uh, we're making, we're working very closely with our Mexican counterparts, however, um, it's, it's an enormous problem. And the, then it's, it's being, you know, dispersed throughout the United States, and, you know, the, the issue with fentanyl is it's incredibly incredibly powerful. It's also super cheap to make and very profitable. So the cartels, the transnational criminal organizations have a huge profit motive to move it. Uh, as, as, as Mike said, and I couldn't concur more with what's been said, as Mike said, you know, we're working so closely with our Canadian counterparts across the border. Uh, you know, the transnational pieces is, is what we do. And uh, we have, we're attached at the hip 
you know, for the investigation with, with Canada and the Border uh, Enforcement Security Task Forces up and down the border and uh, all across the United States for us and globally, and, and you're seeing that here with the Five Eyes Law Enforcement Group. Uh, as far as the piece of, um, you know, our, our Chinese uh, partners uh, doing enough, that's, that's simply no. I don't think they're doing enough. We have a dialogue. We're trying to get them to do more. Uh, we, we need them to do more. We need them to do a lot more. Uh, but uh, there are, it's complicated. These are precursor chemicals in some ways. It's, it's not, as, as Mike said, they're not regulated. They're not, it's not on a face illegal. But if, you know, if they're using 100 times the amount that they could potentially use for a, leg a legitimate use, there's a problem. And uh, this is a huge problem. We have an enormous death toll uh, in the United States from this per capita. I believe uh, you know, Canada is right on our heels, if not beating us on, on per capita death toll. And uh, this is a problem for uh, you know that every every household in the United States. And what we've talked about during this last few days is the fentanyl issue. If it's not in your given jurisdiction, uh, it will be eventually because that profit motive and the ease of sale and just the simplicity of it will will drive organizations there. Graham, are you seeing it in the I UK? So I wanted to pick up on PJ's point. So we saw we saw some fentanyl in 2017, 2018, but small incidents. We came down very hard on it, and it kind of went away. But synthetic opioids, of which fentanyl is obviously one, we are beginning to see. We've had nitazines uh, been a particular issue over the last nine months or, or a year in the in the UK, 130 odd um, deaths from uh, from nitazines. But this is, I think, is actually one of the strengths of the Feleg partnership. So this has clearly been an extraordinary challenge in uh, the United States in Canada. And they have been incredibly gracious uh, in sharing all their learning with us, with Australia, New Zealand uh, and the UK. As PJ said, you know, if it's not with us now, it may well be in the future. It is likely to come. Uh, and so they've been sharing everything they know about it, really thinking about what warnings and indicators we need to look for, what we can do to try and stop it getting a hold in, in our countries because of the enormous increase in the death rate that you get when you get synthetic opioids. And then if I just very briefly link it back to Heather's point about wastewater uh, analysis, I mean, we do this in a number of our jurisdictions, uh, but definitely in the UK as well. And that's one part of being able to spot these things. Uh, when we first did wastewater analysis, we discovered that that showed that the consumption of drugs, of class A drugs in the UK, was three times the level we thought it was before. We had no really scientific way of judging it before. We were looking at what we were able to seize on the streets at the border, and so we had an estimate. We did something scientifically reliable, and it, and it showed it was much greater. So that was an important thing for us to, to realise. But what we can also do is test for different drugs. And even though fentanyl is you know, available, it comes in such small quantities, the amazing scientists that we work with are able to identify it. So we can now spot it coming into the consumption pattern in our country quicker than we might have done previously. So we have to use all the tools at our disposal to try and stay on top of this threat. Yeah. If I just may, and we're talking about it, I should have uh, batted earlier. If you look at a lab that produces three to five kilos of uh, fentanyl over two days, they're making about a million doses, over a million doses. So then those are little pills. So just imagine once that's fabricated, how those pills are, are shipped throughout the world. They can be in small envelopes. They can be bigger package. So uh, thank God for the good collaboration. We're learning. But uh, as I said, it is a challenge. And it's, law enforcement is but one solution to the problem we're facing. Yeah. Are you seeing it in Australia? Yeah. I mean, New Zealand. New Zealand. Sorry. I, <laughs> Too we, long a day. We're very close to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not that close. <laughs> 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 um, we thankfully have seen very little in the way of fentanyl, and we are checking wastewater and monitoring very carefully. Um, methamphetamine is by far our biggest problem, and it causes huge harm in communities as well. I, I think to Mike's point, um, law enforcement can get you so far on drug issues, but we actually need to look more deeply as a society about what's driving it and how we address that. So I guess I should ask you if you're seeing it in New Zealand, but um, <laughs> <laughs> vir yes. virtually the same, same. As, uh, as New Zealand yeah, again. Absolutely. Meth is the big problem, uh, but yeah. monitoring very closely um, uh, fentanyl and, and uh, um, uh, seeing very very little, but yeah. um, the wastewater analysis allows us to keep close track on that. Yeah. PJ, talk to us about crypto and the challenge that poses, especially as it evolves. Yes, absolutely. So it's just, uh, you know, it's a piece of the financial crime uh, network, and it's just, you know, complicated by the cyber environment. Um, so it's another, you know, other means of exchanging, you know, uh, money, essentially. But uh, 
it makes it very difficult to uh, to trace when uh, you know where the, where the money's coming, where it's going to, and it just complicates investigations into uh, all sorts of different criminality. You know, irrespective of of itself, uh, could be fine, but just like technology, it can be ag agnostic depending on how it's used. It's just uh, it's something we concentrate on heavily in our cyber and technology efforts, and it's something that I know affects all of our different agencies. Uh, making sure that we are capable of uh, tracing that information, have the appropriate information, and follow up with our partners on that. So it's it's part of this technology conundrum. Technology is great; it's wonderful. It just depends on how it's being used. Graham, just another angle on how crypto gets involved in crime. So definitely, absolutely, in, in money laundering, and that's uh, that was much talked about before COVID, but it accelerated in COVID, and now has become a fundamental plank of of money laundering. But in addition, what we have seen is it's. Uh, how it's been used in fraud. So there have been an awful lot of investment fraud schemes trying to entice people into invest in crypto, and it just didn't exist. So we've seen a lot of losses in the UK there, and the the, the very strong advice, uh, including from our Bank of England, has been you know do not invest uh, in crypto. Well, that's it. Also, the uh, incredibly uh, painful rise of ransomware that we're dealing with across the the globe. It's enabled also by by this currency, right? It, it, you, you wouldn't be able to affect an international uh, ransomware, hold a, a corporation entity hostage without the ability to uh, convey these funds uh, uh, surreptitiously across the wire to another country. So Austin, what's the solution? Yeah, so this is an area where as we work across our, our sponsors, again, uh, many, many sectors, uh, we see commonality. And this is where we can combine forces rather than have each agency or organization or department solve it on their own. Uh, we're looking at how can we attack it from a broader standpoint. And so this is where our research and development have gone into not only crypto, but also how that impacts the future of digital currency, as an example. And so working with the Treasury Department, for example, as well as IC elements, law enforcement is a value we bring to the table as far as capabilities research that we then provide back to government. Uh, Tim, there's another question that came in with your name on it from uh, Will Vernon. Um, he's asking, are you seeing cyber criminals, scammers in particular, using AI to impersonate people's voices? So. Yeah, and the use of um, AI to, to impersonate voice is not a, alone a federal violation. But if you're using it in furtherance of a crime, then that's a different story. And so, as, as Graham mentioned, there's been financial frauds. Um, there's been uh, information uh, campaigns that individuals have tried to uh, influence uh, the way uh, where election uh, polling uh, locations could be. So in those cases, you know, obviously, these are highly concerning, and um, the U.S. Attorney's Office is uh, looking in, into those cases. Um, so I think you know, this is an emerging technology. We need to continue to stay in front of it. Um, again, with AI, I think we're all still uh, deciding w where the parameters are in like emerging technologies. Uh, there are individuals that are used for good, and then there's individuals that are going to use it for uh, nefarious reasons as well. I want to talk about workforce for a moment because whether I'm talking to industry or I'm talking to military or I'm talking to you guys, people are saying we aren't getting enough people with the tech skills that we need. Um, I see some nodding of heads around the table, so I pr presume it's an issue. What are the solutions to this? Heather? Well, it, it is a very tricky one. I mean, we, we know for a fact that our, uh, we're, we're simply not producing enough uh, to fill the jobs that we, we have now and, and into the future. There's a lot of work going on uh, working with our university sector, our tertiary sector, uh, to make sure we're identifying um, the programs most in demand, the skills that are most in demand, um, certainly working with them to try and, uh, uh, you know, provide those pathways. Uh, we're offering um, uh, to pay for graduate studies and, uh, you know, support students while they're finishing their, their education with a view to coming into the workforce. And I think certainly within Australia, we, we work as a community to make sure that we're not... Um, you know, poaching off each other uh, unnecessarily, but creating opportunities across the community for people with these these skills, um, so that they're uh, not leaving one, but perhaps uh, not leaving the com uh, community uh, if they move on from one agency to another. 
So working in ways that we are sharing the resource uh, and allowing us to um, surge where we need to in particular instances by, um, by, by sharing the resource or, or seconding. But it is just an ongoing challenge, and I think it's, it's you know, we're going to have to look at our immigration programs and, uh, and again, further, further focus on our university programs. Lisa? Can I offer two things uh, that we're doing, um, certainly uh, in Australia? One of them is a project we're very proud of. It's called the Dandelion Project. And uh, what we're targeting with that particular program is uh, young people. Uh, and we bring them in to the AFP in partnership with industry uh, where for two years we train them up and uh, the significance of this particular project, it gets back to recruitment and skills, is we're talking about neurodiverse young people who we know um, have a lot of skills in terms of tech and the sort of things that we will be looking for going forward but may not be successful in securing a job as a police officer, for example. So uh, we're, we're, uh, that, uh, in, with that particular project, we're looking to share that more broadly because um, we're seeing some really significant successes um, with the skills and the uplift of the young people that we're bringing in. If I could touch on one other um, initiative that we're also doing, um, and that is, again, very much targeting our youth. Um, and uh, through our uh, Joint Policing Cybercrime Coordination Centre, we call it JPC3, uh, with it's, uh, held, it's situated in New South Wales, uh, we're targeting um, through the New South Wales education system young people up until 17 who have um, skills in hacking uh, and we bring them in and do a bit of a boot camp with them. And the aim of that particular one is to guide them away from um, moving down a path of criminality and refocus them into the right thing to do and the right behaviours and use their skills for good. Again, we're starting to see some success with that one and that will be an ongoing pro uh, program. So I guess a multifaceted approach to how we can target uh, those different um, elements of the community that will have the skills uh, for all of our agencies going forward. I mean, yeah, I, I think the challenge is uh, salary in the private sector, salary from government employees. Yes. Uh, that's, that's a challenge, but I still do think that there is people out there that want to do police work because they're excited by it. Uh, for, uh, from an RCMP perspective, uh, we've uh, had a long tradition of recruiting uh, police officers into one form of training, and it's really good that we're doing really good training. They get them ready for the frontline work. But on the federal side of things, when it involves national security, cyber, we've changed our approach where we're going to have a direct entry into that. So we'll be able to be far more strategic in getting the right skill sets that we need to move things. The one point, I mean, we're doing very much the same things as others have talked about. The one point I wanted to add, it builds on Mike, is so we're not going to be able to pay the same. We need to pay a bit more, but we won't pay the same. But we do offer an incredible mission. Yeah. And, and people get incredibly inspired and excited by that. Does it work? Does that sound? So uh, up to a point, yes, it does. I mean, we, we still employ people. I've got people working for me who could earn, you know, five, ten times the amount they, uh, they earn for us in the private sector. But they love what they do. They love the impact they can have. And the extra thing I was going to mention, they love what they are allowed to do. So because we have certain powers and it's all authorised with warrants, we are able to do things that in anywhere else in the world would be illegal. They can really let their skills, you know, absolutely go to full to the full extent, and that's a good offer as well. So the mission is a great offer, and then the ability to do things that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do that, that helps keep people in. Yeah. The the other thing uh, picks up on Lisa's point about uh, attraction. Um, Again, significantly better, but significantly under rep representation of women uh, in this field, and so a lot of programs in Australia, and I know um, elsewhere. Um, to raise awareness, try to attract uh, more women, um, develop more bespoke uh, programs uh, through schools from primary up through university um, to get more young, young women into this field uh, and, and paint the picture of what the career path is, including uh, the attractiveness that, um, that Graham has, uh, has highlighted as well. Yeah, I would totally footstop that as well. We are aggressively reaching out to underserved groups to try to bring them on and um, in any way, we want to look like the communities that we serve. And college degrees, are they still mandatory in these fields? Uh, no? Not for us. Okay. Um, so you're all here to collaborate, and I'm wondering about possible barriers um, to collaboration. Um, and I want to talk about it in, with the frame of data. 
uh, which has become so incredibly important in all aspects of your work. And I'm wondering, um, and Austin, you may have a good perspective on this, how siloed is the data, both potentially within governments, but also between governments, and what are the barriers to really sharing? Right, and, and thanks to the opportunity. I, I touched on it briefly earlier. I think today we need to view data as a commodity, right? The value that data brings and the value we get out of that data, rather than, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the sourcing and such, right? And so that puts it in a different context as far as the, the, the vast potential of it. And, and so if there's uh, silos or constructs or even uh, policies and authorities that allow that not allow the free flow to occur, that's going to hold us back. And so the idea here is not to, again, give away sensitive sources, but somehow uh, in a more creative way uh, compartmentalize the sourcing from the value of the data. And, and so I think we just need to begin by thinking of data differently to then create the new constructs to which we, how we uh, manage or, or handle data and then it's for the collaboration. Great. So on intelligence, we're actually really good at sharing that and really quickly across our organization. So kind of micro packets of data, brilliant at. Bulk data is harder. And that's one of the things we've been discussing, how we can get better at sharing our kind of bulk data, as Austin said, particularly when it's kind of covert sources. I wouldn't underestimate how much benefit we can get out of using open source data as well, or data we can buy, and really going across that and, and getting as much value out of it as we can. Um, two, two final points. One, uh, I think people put a lot of cultural barriers in the way of sharing data as well. The law actually permits an awful lot more sharing within uh, jurisdictions and between jurisdictions. And there is a fear of going across data protection uh, boundaries, which really gets in the way. So we need to drive at that. And final point, uh, we've been a brilliant success through uh, Congress in getting the Cloud Act passed a few years ago. And on the back of that, UK-US data access agreement, same with uh, Australia, that allows us to be able to go into the, the tech sector and, and get the information direct from them without having to go through a very lengthy legal process. And that's been a real boom for us. I think it's important to mention, though, too, that there's times, though, that uh, data does need to be protected individually, especially in criminal investigations that might involve grand jury or other information that, and, and the public needs to know that, that in an environment where we want our global uh, partners to be sharing uh, threat information <coughs> and to be able to take action on those threats to mitigate them, but that also that um, their individual nation uh, protective rights uh, still stand and that the protection of their data in lawful process is, is also being adhered to. Open source data was mentioned. It seems like a treasure trove. Are you exploiting it, do you think, to its full potential? A la okay, you're laughing. You have to answer oh, yeah, that. Well, it's because you finished the sentence with to its full potential. So are we exploiting it? Yes. Um, is there an awful to lot more to go? Potential. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th there is... There is so much more scope to uh, to go there, but we have started and we're doing some really good work with it. But I'd also like to just really echo Tim's points and no one should be under any illusions that we don't take data protection and data rights incredibly seriously. We absolutely do. But even within that, there is so much more we can do to get the best value out and help protect the publics that yeah. we serve. Yeah, and uh, I echo that as well. It's responsible use of how we use the data and that we have to protect it in a certain way depending on the data source and various things. And it's also, you say, you know, we're using all we can open source. One of the problems we have is between uh, the data we get because of, you know, our search warrants, our seizures, or whatever else, uh, in addition to open source, is we have, in modern society, so much data. We're almost drowning in data. And part of the technological challenge is how, how do we tease out what's useful? And you could have a mountain of it, but if you don't, if you can't make good use of this, it's virtually worthless. That's a challenge with part of this. And if I may, open source, yeah, we explore it uh, fully uh, within legislation uh, parameters, but when it's on open source, it's, it's available to everyone. Uh, the misconception is that people believe in Canada that law enforcement are using open source and are actually getting into email accounts and whatnot, and that's not what it is. It's, it's anybody can go on open source and do that search. It's just uh, law enforcement have different tools to search, uh, to do more pointy search or uh, more uh, f faster search on the internet for what we're looking for. 
but we're not infringing on privacies of individuals. It's yeah. information that's there. Anything we have to do when it comes to the privacy issue, there's a judicial process that we must follow and respect uh, to go down that road. Austin, I, yes. I'm curious as to whether there are institutional obstacles. Yeah, I think uh, an approach, and I completely agree with, with, with Michael's point on, on the, uh, the civil liberties aspect, and, and more so as you look at open source from the optic of open source intelligence, I think uh, what the uh, community needs is a set of professionals that better understand that as intelligence source. So perhaps I think our U.S. Army has started with their uh, creating a open source intelligence field training uh, intel specialists focused on that, really to get at the veracity and the reliability of the sourcing. If we uh, look at the more traditional intel uh, streams such as human, SIGINT, and others, we have professionals that understand, okay, this SIGINT is this reliable because of XYZ that we can't get in this room, but we also need something similar from an open source standpoint, and also that lends that professional credibility to talk about the things that, that, that Michael addressed as far as this is not infringement of rights, this is done through a you know proper authorities, open source executive agent uh, type of authorities, and so I think having a open source professional uh, cadre uh, is, it will help further the value of open source intelligence. Yeah. Just again to echo that, yeah, you know, at the FBI, we do need an investigative need to look into. It's not a, um, uh, an issue of just combing through. There has to be some type of initiation of why we'd be looking into uh, particular information. Again, always concerned with, with civil liberties and mitigating threats. Absolutely. We've been talking a lot about threats here and a few that we know are coming, but I'm wondering if there is one thing or two things that each of you sees looming out there, perhaps just beyond the horizon, that you're really watching carefully. Lisa, do you have any thoughts? Oh, I thought you said something. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. That's a really good question. Um, uh, look, uh, to me, I think we, we've really touched on like, the technology piece, I think, um, and the globalization um, in, uh, that it, it encourages of crime more broadly. Um, the rapid rate that it's evolving means we have, you know, we, we're just not keeping up. Uh, our laws are not uh, keeping up with how technology is advancing. So for me, the top one is that and, and developing the tools, having those partnerships, collaborating in forums such as this so that we can continue to try and uh, keep ahead of the curve. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if if I if I think about that question uh, more in sort of like the, the the global context or the strategic environment that 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 we're in or that's looming, I mean, obviously we're we're at a very different period in time. Uh, we're we're in a period of of, of greater instability, more yeah. strategic unrest, uh, more strategic challenge. Um, that's creating you know uh, ructions uh, and distractions and. Uh, really, you know, turning, you know, probably weaknesses or cracks and vulnerabilities into things that are widening. And I think when you when you have that sort of uncertainty and instability, uh, I think that that creates an environment where uh, where criminality can uh, you know can uh, prosper and uh, and thrive, uh, particularly when our you know respective governments are, are very much focused on, on, on a range of, of quite critical threats uh, mm -hmm. going forward. So, uh, you know, I think, I think in a broad sense, um, this, this global instability uh, creates a ripe environment for, for, for more criminality. Uh, and uh, uh, it's going to be very difficult as, as resources are stretched, uh, monitoring and managing uh, a range of challenges that we're, that we're all facing. Tim? I would say, so uh, a large threat coming from nation state actors. Uh, the director recently mentioned China, uh, oftentimes uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea. And then the, the extension of criminal aspects merging with nation state threats. Okay, so whether it's, it's um, cyber threats coming from, from Russia, whether it's um, financial frauds emitting from uh, from China, along with precursors there, um, whether it's uh, operations done by Iran against dissidents, um, and uh, cryptocurrency thefts from North Korea. Okay, the the blending of these powerful nation states 
and uh, used in uh, multiple ways that, that go from everywhere from national security concerns to criminal level concerns? I would say that not since we've touched on it many times, but not having the, the just the capability or the resources to keep up with the criminality. Um, we've the, reached a point where technology is evolving, as has been stated, so fast, uh, we risk not being able to combat that criminality. We need to be able to be nimble and move at the speed of crime, we're, and rightfully so, we're, we have to follow policies, procedures, and we have the rule of law. But our, our adversaries, which are the criminals, do not. And that's what worries me is that we're going we're gonna to lose that battle and not have the technology capability and resources to keep up with that criminality. And they have unlimited resources. Mm -hmm. And they don't, don't have rules. Right. Yeah, mine's more of a general policing concern. As a single national police service, we rely um, on our communities to be well functioning, uh, to be able to police effectively. Uh, for me, the way technology is shaping our understanding of the world the polarising effect of social media in due course turbocharged by generative AI um, can open up chasms that makes it difficult to police. Uh, you know, as has been said, the opportunities that creates for criminality, the way it can make people respond in extreme ways to uh, their perception, which may or may not actually be true, um, I think risks undermining the foundation of, of policing. Yeah. I would uh, echo Lisa and what some others have said. The uh, rapid uh, growth of technology and the speed it's going at, just keeping pace with that is a challenge. And the other one is uh, not necessarily over the horizon, but we're in it right now, uh, public trust and social cohesion. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do? Uh, it, there's so many conspiracy theories going on, uh, and it's, 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 it's challenging uh, because social media is being used. There's misinformation going on. But uh, key for any law enforcement organization in the world is to have that public trust, and, and, and we have to make sure that uh, we either rebuild it or solidify what, what exists. Austin? From my optic, uh, I have to agree with Tim's uh, first point about the threat coming from Xi Jinping's regime from the People's Republic of China as our number one most enduring threat. Uh, when viewed through the optic of our work with DOD, our work with the intelligence community, our work with other parts of government, which requires a closer coordination across more traditional lines uh, and, and the blending of a whole of government, whole nation approach, and to have the honor to host a multinational uh, gathering like the Five Eyes is something that we might have tried to bring in and really focus on as far as our role in helping connect areas that we're seeing uh, common uh, opportunities. And, and so I think it's really the long term threat from uh, Pacific uh, should be interesting. Graham? So I wrote down a couple of things when you asked the question and I've been wondering whether to change them now because they've all been covered. <laughs> but, I, but I won't because they, they are absolutely what I think uh, and we just share the same view. So technology has and is transforming crime. It has given criminals scale and reach that they have just not had before. And crime has gone from being local and one-to-one -to, -one to global and one-to-many. And that is the big challenge that, that we are facing. With, with AI, we've seen it so far just augment the existing crimes and what worries me is at some point we'll see a new type of crime that we just haven't seen before come out as a result of AI. And because of that technology, its impact will be just so large. So that's what I'll be watching. And the thing we need to protect, exactly as Andrew and, and Mike said, is, is the trust and confidence. The trust and confidence, not just in us as police forces and law enforcement organizations, but the trust and confidence among our community and with the institutions that, that help communities function. And that feels in tension and under threat at the moment, but it's fundamental to our societies kind of working effectively. And anything we can do to try and help protect that is really important, but our ability to police and keep people safe depends on it. If I, if I may, it, it just touch on all this again, like that's the fundamental piece yeah. is we have democratic societies and we, we police with the consent of the government. And we're not, you know, overlords, and we're working with our populace. And if we don't have their trust, then it'll it'll never work. Perfect place to end. Thank, Thank you, you all for participating in this robust conversation. I appreciate it. And now go forth and innovate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.